Welcome to First Trinity Unity Community Church of the United States. How can we feed you today? Who's teaching? Pastor Wilkes. No, I'm not so crazy about him. Oh, uh, I meant uh, Pastor Johnson, of course. Sorry for the mix-up. That's more like it. Now look, I don't want any of that Old Testament business today. I want to focus on the New Testament. Well, of course, sir. The Old Testament God is me. I mean, he is a lot happier now, so let's focus on the present. Certainly. I want some creative illustrations. I want to laugh a little bit, but not too much. I want my communion crackers broken for me with 100% <laughs> with 100% natural grape juice. I know that stuff last week was from Ken. You think that's honoring to God? No, sir. Of course not. I didn't think so. And I want to feel encouraged and uplifted and affirmed this week. And look, I want some healing for my bunion. And I don't want to be challenged too much, just a little bit, okay? Because I'm challenged enough during work. Certainly. This is a safe place. A happy place. I'd be a lot happier if you had, if you had something in the fifth row or so. Certainly. That's what I'm talking about. Eating grass may seem like an unorthodox way to show your religious devotion. But for members of the Raboni Center Ministries in Hurankura, South Africa, grazing on greenery is a key part of their spiritual practice. Pastor Liseho Daniel, who runs the ministry, believes it brings worshippers closer to God, with some members of the congregation even claiming it has cured them of serious health defects. I want to lead people to a place they've never been today. You are here in this church, but I'm taking you on a journey. Wake up! The pastor uses his services to lead his followers on a spiritual journey. I'm taking you to hell. I'm leading you to hell. See how hell looks like. We're coming back. Let's come back. Are you hungry? Be, sip, 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 sip. Be quiet. Okay, go and eat, go and eat. And while the group's unusual eating habits have attracted controversy online, members of the ministry have no plans to stop the practice. If Jesus turned water into wine, we're turning the grass into spaghetti mince. Because of deceitfulness, lust excited by deceit, and deceitful influences seducing to sin. Deceitful lusts by a paragram are being applied to the agape love feasts, the communal celebration in the church in which food, fellowship, and worship is shared in an assembly. Base men have transformed this church celebration into seductive revels through things pleasing to the eye with the power to attract, bewitch, and captivate under a magic spell. Music, the light, the crowds, it looks like
like a rock concert. And the lines around the block are enough to make any nightclub envious. But this, this is church. They are testing, tempting, and provoking many by arousing sexual desires and influencing others to do things that are unwise and morally wrong. This is done to cheat and beguile. They are distracting people's attention by musing and charming them to divert them from the truth that they may be deceived. How far have we fallen as a church? You know, I'm a fan. I've been a fan, long-time fan of Hillsong's music. But this Hillsong church is clearly under the direction of the New World Order. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist.
The term New Age was exposed and the teachings were exposed in the 1980s, early 1990s. So the New Age cleverly morphed into new gospel, new spirituality. The New Age meets and merges, not emerges, but merges as the emergent emerging church. It's really the merging church. The new spirituality has nothing new about it. It's simply the old occultism that has been around since the Garden of Eden. It is found now in many different forms. It was called New Age. Now they figured out that's no longer a popular term. So they call it new spirituality. But in the church, we find it in many different forms. The emerging movement, the positive confession movement, the word faith movement, the contemplative movement, the uh, new apostolic reformation. So basically, it's simply incorporating elements of old ancient occultism that devalue the Bible and are now surging and emerging, if you will, within the church itself. We have a very clever adversary who knows how to redefine and reinvent the Christian faith. And that's what we're watching happen right before our very eyes. In the world religions, there's always been this, uh, this fascination with the mystical. And uh, it's, it's kind of a hallmark of what they believed. Now, we have that all the way back within Christianity through the Gnostics and then through the, the Desert Fathers and, and the Middle Ages and, and uh, a lot of the mysticism that came through Catholicism. But those things were kind of more out on the margins. Uh, they were only in, in particular groups of people within denominations. What we're finding now is that that is hitting the mainstream of Christianity. Barbara Marks Hubbard, probably the, almost the, the matriarch of today's contemporary New Age movement, has a book called Emergence, The Shift from Ego to Essence, Ten Steps to the Universal Human. David Spangler, father of the New Age, called the shaman of the New Age, has a book called Emergence, The Rebirth of the Sacred, The God Within. The book As Above, So Below, written by the editors of New Age magazine, talk about the emergent spirituality. And they talk all about contemplative prayer and esoteric Christianity. Thomas Keating is a Trappist monk who in the 60s realized that there was a tremendous influence of Eastern mysticism with the young people. He discovered that these practices by one of the early mystics and Roman Catholic contemplatives was virtually identical in substance and practice to the techniques they'd been learning from Zen masters. Thomas Keating popularized the movement called centering where you take a single word and begin using that as a mantra to focus and center your mind and your spirit through which you can open up and commune with the divine. And actually Thomas Keating has acknowledged that that practice of contemplative meditation, even in its Christianized version, is identical to the Eastern meditation and will also, like the Eastern meditation, open up the serpent power, the Kundalini demonic force to rise up even in devoted young Catholics practicing these occult techniques. One thing that, that permeates all throughout those different belief systems is a movement towards an experience-based kind of Christianity. They want something that is different from what they can just hold in their hands or read in, a, in the Bible. They want something that is sensual. We are being told, not only by the New Age, New Spirituality, but by many who are now in leadership, that we need to have spiritual experiences for an authentic faith. As far as Christianity is concerned, the corruption is coming into the church from outside. We're embracing those things that God speaks nothing of in Scripture unless He's speaking against it. And a lot of Christian leaders are really devaluing the Bible. And that's really very common in the, in the merging, emerging New Spirituality church. The Bible is really reliable, and you always have to defer to the Bible, not to spiritual experience. One of the biggest movements going on in the church right now is how do we unite the various faiths? Um, so you find a great deal of outreach on, on behalf of uh, various groups, Roman Catholicism right at the forefront of it. Uh, but Rick Warren is a big advocate of this as well. And so the idea that we can merge varying beliefs since we all believe in God. Peter Drucker, one of the business geniuses who's helped develop many programs, he was one of the key mentors of Rick Warren, who used his uh, methodology of a three-legged stool, bringing in government, the financial aspect, and the churches to help bring in a new model for the church and to grow the church 
It evolved into something that uh, was seeker-friendly, that wasn't interested in necessarily bringing in absolute truth or a study of the word, but something that appealed to young people, that appealed to the felt needs of the individuals in the community. And by so doing, bringing down any emphasis on the gospel or the solid objective source of truth of the word, because that wasn't going to sell a church program. There is now a new reformation being headed up, not surprisingly, by Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, who is seeking now to bring his peace plan into a global perspective, where he hopes to recruit a billion people who will bring about the end of all the world's ills. When we look at the term New Reformation, we have to think of where did it first show up. It showed up with Robert Schuller, this 1982 book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation, talking about God's dream. Rick Warren now has a peace plan that he calls God's dream for you and the world. Oprah is using the term God's dream, and both the New Age and the church, Erwin McManus used the term, uses the term God's dream. It's a metaphor for the coming world peace. The Bible has told us that one of the signs of the end of the age would be a very clear, very deliberate move to an establishment of a one world government, which would be brought into a cohesiveness and a unity through a one world religion, a utopian religion. And it is not coincidental that the occultists and the New Agers for many, many years have been looking for the formation of a one-world government, a one-world religion, which would bring a utopia on Earth. What we see in modern ecumenism and the call towards all faiths becoming one and all the various Christianity becoming one, this is exactly what we know that the end times would be like. The idea of a consolidated belief system. The church somehow thinks in, in some quarters that it has the, it, the task of setting up the kingdom of God. It's Jesus who sets up his own kingdom. And we are the ones who inherit it. It's Jesus who ushers it in, not the other way around. We don't usher it in for him. The kingdom of God is not something that's made with man's hands. We aren't building it. It's not something that, that uh, we have a hand in making because the Bible says we inherit that. So how do you inherit something if you're the one who builds it? There is now a counterfeit kingdom of God that is being brought in by the radical Pentecostals and Charismatics who came out of the Azusa Street Revival, which then became in the 1940s and 50s the Latter Rain Movement. Uh, an offshoot from them became the Manifested Sons of God and part of the aberrant theology from a man named William Branham. One of the teachings he had was that we were going to manifest as sons of God, we were going to become divine, and that we were going to bring in the kingdom of God before Jesus came. I really believe that a lot of the men that are involved in leadership in the church that are bringing these new teachings in believe that what they're doing is of God. For all I know, they have a voice that's directing them. They just haven't tested the spirits because I can tell you that what they are teaching is contrary to the scripture. Hi guys, I can barely believe what I walked into in a Christian meeting a couple of weeks ago. And this is not the first time this has happened in a Christian church or organization here in Jerusalem. And I just despair at the deception, the counterfeit spirit, the uh, kundalini evil that is coming in to our buildings and you know, into the hearts of, of people who are perhaps striving to know God. But what's even more worrying is that there's no shepherds to look out for them. I'm gonna show you the footage that I took when I walked into this meeting. And it, as you'll see, it's all about birthing this Kundalini spirit is the most disturbing thing I have ever walked into, especially in a place that's Christian. So I show you this, you know, please turn it off if it disturbs you because it's very disturbing, but this is demonic, this is evil, and I show you this to warn you to stay well away from this type of thing. It is not Christianity, it is the New Age Kundalini Antichrist spirit.
Castle TV. There's a great deception coming, folks. It's been drunk in the spirit. <laughs> These people are under the influence of a cruel form of hypnotism in which their psyche is broken down to leave them vulnerable to the power of suggestion and the manipulation of demonic spirits. This also seemed to have a specific goal into making them reenact the birthing process of a woman. <laughs> strange than not was that the this was just a few days after September the 23rd this year when all the people across the world were talking about this Revelation 12 sign and as you just heard the dragon not catching and devouring the babies that's a direct quotation from that passage and of course it includes that birthing this imitative magic it seems of corrupting these Christian people and making them enact through these familiar deceptive spirits this birthing action. Illuminized Freemasonry has adopted this picture of the first family of paganism as the formula by which they intend to produce their Masonic Christ or Antichrist on the world scene. Masons believe that the divine child, the Masonic Christ, will be conceived and born on the spiritual plane and that conception and delivery will be transferred to the physical plane. In fact, there was a number of desecrations that took place with the Mekadeshet festival uh, during this period of time in Jerusalem. It was it seemed like a sustained attack from the enemy. And what's worse is these young, influential people are caught right in the middle of it. 
Now the basic question that we're asking in this documentary is why are these manifestations so similar to Eastern religions and Hinduism and the Kundalini cults and yet they're not found in scripture, they're not found in the Bible, they're not found in classical Christianity at all. <laughs> Now this all began with Rodney Howard Brown imparting a new anointing into a bunch of leaders and they spread it around the world. The Kundalini spirit, which is a serpent spirit that has been brought into the Western culture or Western world through many Pentecostal preachers who, my friend, they, they are very charismatic. They have been hungry for power and it has opened them up to this fraudulent counterfeit with they attribute to being the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, my friend, is the mind of God. He is the communicator of heaven and he does not make a fool out of you. He does not make a scene out of you. This 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 is the 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 channeling, the summoning of these uh evil spirits oftentimes is through music. Because why? Music sets the atmosphere and oftentimes people tend to relax and they empty themselves out. They, they really become more uh, vulnerable to being open to this demonic spirit. The Bible clearly teaches us, beloved, John said, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit to see if it be of God. Be vigilant, be sober, because you have an adversary and he mimics and counterfeits everything that is of God. And he started to laugh for half an hour. He couldn't control himself. Он не мог контролировать себя. He just себя. laughed and laughed. Он просто смеялся there, и смеялся. There was no preaching. And he told us, this is a new move of the Holy Ghost. Это новое движение Святого Духа. Just laughing. Только смех. And he calls it a move of God. Let me ask you a question. Позвольте задать вам вопрос. The Holy Ghost who wrote this book, who says the truth sets you free, would he cause the minister to laugh so he cannot preach this word? It's crazy. Where's the spiritual discernment? Here's a man, and he's walking through the congregation, hissing at people like a snake. And they start wiggling on the floor like a snake. People down here barking. That's not what I read about my Jesus. I don't see altar calls. I don't see people weeping for sin. This deception stems from the pagan movements that the Holy Spirit is a female energy that will transcend all our restrictions, which is clearly the direct opposite of what the Bible actually says. And from this we understand that this counterfeit version of the Holy Spirit is just a ruse to cover the fact that what is really being summoned in these rituals is the goddess Diana or the Kabbalistic spirit of Sophia, Shekinah, the Kundalini spirit of enlightenment, Isis, and all of the above. What we are really talking about is Lucifer. The Bible should act as our anchor or as our mooring, uh, so that we're just not carried around wherever the, the tide wants to take us. The Bible is supposed to be the foundation for everything that we believe. It's the only way of knowing truth. Foundationally, if we don't and can't rely upon the Bible, then it's going to give rise to all kinds of odd doctrines and belief of end times. And it's what's given rise to, uh, to much of the, the bad teaching that is in the church. Uh, bad eschatology gives rise to very bad doctrine. Traditional teaching of scripture is that Jesus will come back at a predefined time. Um, the message of much of the church nowadays doesn't believe that, nor does it teach it. The devil doesn't want people to be focused on what's to come. He wants us to be very much engaged with the things going on down here on earth. 
If we believe that Jesus could come back at any moment, it's going to change the way that we engage this world. But if you believe that Jesus can't come back to the earth until we fix everything down here, and that everybody's going to eventually get to heaven anyway, you can go ahead and take a very, very uh, uncommitted view of your Christianity. You can get very involved in the things of this world. But if you believe that Jesus could come back at any minute, it'll absolutely revolutionize the way that you engage the culture and the world around you. Our young people are not going to be reached through emergent gimmicks and techniques, through candles or labyrinths, through pizza parties, through chanting parties, through meditation techniques and yoga seminars. These young people aren't going to be reached because you are conforming the gospel to their culture, but because you are bringing the gospel to them in their culture and saying to them, the Lord is relevant for you today. For his gospel, his word of salvation, is what will bring you into that relationship with God without the use of gimmicks or occult techniques. What makes a Christian? Not the church that you go to. It's not the, the creed or doctrine that you hold to. It's not your education. It's very simply, do you believe what the Bible says? We embrace the lie because the father of lies masquerades as an angel of light. He uses pieces of the truth to shape the lie, so the lie appears to be the truth. How can we recognize the difference between the truth and the lie? The enemy ingeniously crafts the lie to appear as light. Charity, benevolence, enlightenment, purpose, mind, body, spirit, coexist, world peace, tolerance, justice, politically correct, heavenly, angelic, but denies the true light of Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Is God behind the world peace movement? Would Jesus preach the coexist gospel? Is the Holy Spirit part of the mind-body-spirit craze? See to it that the light within you is not darkness. One aspect of appealing to the postmodern generation is to introduce techniques, spirituality, litanies, rituals, and so on. This is called vintage Christianity or ancient future Christianity. Let's go back to the disciplines of the monks. Let's introduce some of the ideas of the East from yoga. Yoga, 2,000-year-old pagan religious philosophy, which is now widespread throughout the emergent church movement. Never see Jesus talking about walking prayer labyrinths, teaching his disciples to practice yoga, practice contemplative prayer. These are all things that don't come from biblical Christianity at all, but are being embraced by the emergent church today because they're looking for some kind of subjective, personal encounter with the divine. And so they say that if we can find these kinds of things in other religions, let's borrow these things from other religions and just call them Christian. For those uh, who profess to be a part of the evangelical church, they're now introducing prayer altars, prayer labyrinths, uh, techniques, bells, incense, candles, all of these things that have a very sensual seduction, but they are not biblical. Many people who are seeking after an experience to participate in Christianity are not interested in studying the Word of God. They say that you know teaching the Bible word by word or verse by verse, that just doesn't work today. What you need is the experiences that you need to be able to smell God, taste God, feel God, touch God. Years ago, Psychology Today said that the Eastern worldview, Eastern religions would come to the West as a psychology. Psychology is not science, it is experiential. It has to do with feelings and moods and understanding. It also teaches um, bottom line that we are innately good. This is an idea out of Hinduism. Christ in New Age terms is a state of being rather than a person. It means someone who is in touch with their higher self or their true self. They see Jesus as someone who came to show us our divinity. But this was God in the occultic sense. This is not the Judeo-Christian God. This was 
a god that resonated with the Hindu and Buddhist concepts of God, a God that you could have mystical experiences with, the God that you could embrace through uh, meditative practices, New Age spirituality. The concept of the divine and all is now considered to be quite normal, whereas before it was considered to be blasphemous. Contemplative prayer, also known as centering prayer, is where we can come to the fuller understanding of the unity of all that is. Well, these are classic Hindu concepts, you know, all is one, unity of all it is. In other words, there's no such thing as good or evil or the kingdom of God, kingdom of Satan, that all is one, everything is united. The practice of contemplative prayer is a mystical tradition, which goes back centuries and can be traced back to a group called the Desert Fathers. It's presented as the way to know God at a deeper level. The centering prayer was where one goes into the silence, one takes a Christian word and says it over and over again, and you go into altered states of consciousness and you actually come out with the same mindset as people who are doing yoga. These ideas take people away from the Word of God towards mystical experiences, and these experiences are exactly the kinds of things that are practiced in the East by those who promote Eastern mysticism. Contemplative spirituality is a belief that I can look within. It's a very subjective and experiential technique for finding truth, but not based on the Word of God based on somebody's feelings and experience. And what we have to understand is that in a mystical way of approaching God, it's all subjective. It's all what, what you hear in your altered states of consciousness. Christians have to base our faith on what the Bible says. Christians have to have faith in the Word. Non-Christians have to hear the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. One of the major ideas of the purpose-driven movement is that the world can be transformed by working together for the cause of good, to bring a social change on planet Earth, to eradicate AIDS, poverty, illiteracy, and other major problems that the world faces. Rick Warren in the purpose-driven movement is going to reform the church. So he says his idea is that we're going to change what the church does using modern marketing techniques and business management techniques, Rick Warren has a program called the Peace Plan. Rather than going forth and preaching the gospel authoritatively, calling people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent of their sins, and to uh, serve Him. Jesus clearly told us that the end was coming and that as the end drew near, we would see more and more chaos, confusion, catastrophe in our world. And this is why, as Christians, we need to keep the gospel at the forefront, which is the eternal heart condition of men and women. The peace plan is we're going to go out and solve the world's problems, cooperating with the other world religions. Rick Warren, he even says that the man of peace who could help you in a village can be a a Muslim. Can you work with Muslims? Can you work with Hindus and bring this all together as one global faith? Biblical Christians believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He came once, paid the penalty for our sins. He's coming again. We look for his return. Other religions have messianic ideas. They believe that someone is going to come and solve the problems of the world. For example, in Islam, the twelfth imam who's going to come and deal with all the kinds of issues that, that are problematic today. Within Hinduism, they're looking for an avatar, looking for another incarnation. In Tibetan Buddhism, another Dalai Lama. The problem is, is that these are false messiahs, and the only one who's going to fit their definition, their view, is the Antichrist. The emergent church really believe that we can eliminate poverty, we can save the environment, we can uh, end racism and genocide and all the social ills in the world. And that is the gospel for the emergent church. This is an ecumenical idea. Ecumenism meaning that, um, uh, that all religions have a part to play in solving the problems that we see around the world. The Roman Catholic Church is really the catalyst for the ecumenical movement today. It's building bridges into all Christian denominations, and that's what ecumenism is. It's an attempt to unite all of Christianity. There's been a great influence by the Roman Catholic religion. Their eschatology says that Jesus Christ will not return until the whole world is Roman Catholic. And so they have an ambition to unite all of Christianity under the power and influence of the Pope. 
prophecy tells us that there will be an apostate form of Christianity. And we see that there's two streams of Christianity operating side by side for the last 2,000 years. You have the apostolic church founded by the Lord Jesus Christ that follows the teachings of the apostles. And then you have the apostate church operating right along with it. And those are following doctrines of demons. It's a false brand of Christianity. There is a new gospel being promoted today by the emergent church. There are many church leaders who say we need to reinvent Christianity. These popular movements are creating alternatives to biblical Christianity. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few are those who are on that path. But wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are those that travel that path. the so-called church who have made an idol they have created a god who doesn't exist doesn't exist doesn't exist there are millions of ways to be a then human how do being you god? And, and many ways no but many paths to what you call god that and her crazy. path might be something else and when she gets there she might call it the light but her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. Yeah, but if you really look at both sides, I there could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? There is one way and only one way, and there that is through Jesus. Jesus. There couldn't possibly be with because a million you of people say in the world. There, there couldn't possibly be. Then when someone comes later and tries to preach the gospel to them because they're living in the world, they won't listen. Because a religious lie has so much power. I feel like if I can be pure and feel good before God that I, I don't have to... You know, I always want to listen to people and receive good criticism, but I just feel like I don't have to answer them. I have to answer to God. And so I just try to stay focused on what God's called me to do. Because the God they've been worshiping is not the God of the Bible. It's a figment of their own imagination, a God they made with their mind, and then they worship what they made. And he looks more like Santa Claus than he does Yahweh. Now, let me tell you something about false teachers. You think so many times that people fall prey to false teachers. And that, in a sense, can be true at times. But I think the dominant theme in Scripture is just the opposite. False teachers are God's judgment on people who don't want God, but in the name of religion, plan on getting everything their carnal heart desires. That's why a Joel Olstein is raised up. Those people who sit under him are not victims of him. He is the judgment of God upon them because they want exactly what he wants and it's not God. When we obey God, we're not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves. Just do good for your own self. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself. Those people who sit under him are not victims of him. He is the judgment of God upon them because they want exactly what he wants and it's not God. When we obey God, we're not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves. Obviously, as you can see, they're into spreading this drunkenness anointing, just like the others we've looked at. For years, Bill's wife, Benny Johnson, has been the senior co-pastor of Bethel alongside her husband. And this woman is into some truly weird new agey stuff, reflexology, and much more. Benny Johnson herself put out this picture. She's lying soaking on C.S. Lewis's grave. These are students from Bethel's School of Ministry and they've been photographed around the world lying on the graves of dead Christian leaders. There's a teaching in some of these circles that you can soak up the anointing by lying on their graves. And I'll tell you what, when the Word of God comes forth in its power and unction, it'll do one of two things. It'll either break you or harden you. It'll break you or harden you. It'll judge you. The 
world will judge you or break you. The apostate church simply endures the prophetic voice. They pass it by with a condescending smile. I'm going to read to you. Listen to Ezekiel 33. Don't turn me, just listen to it. He said, they come to you as my people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they don't do it. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their own gain and their idols. And behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. And they hear your words, but they do not practice them. And I can quote a hundred scriptures against this kind of idolatry. And, and, and people come up and pat me on the back and say, good preaching, brother, if I believe it, and go right back that very night and sit and watch filth. And it's kind of an amusing message. It's kind of a novel thing to hear someone prophesy now. What's it going to be for you, brother, sister? Is it going to be that you hear the prophetic word of the Lord come? And then you walk out and sing a sweet, sensual song and go right back and do the same very thing. We have these large churches filled with many unconverted carnal people. But in those churches, we also have this small group of people that honestly want Christ and they honestly want His Word, and they honestly want to be transformed. They don't need anything else. All they need is true worship of the true God and Scripture being preached to them and lived out before them. That's what they want. Now, I want to tell you the great sin of the American pastor. And this has got me in a lot of trouble, but it's true. This small group of converted people in that local church, all they want is Jesus. And all they want to do is the right thing. They want purity. They want truth. They want Christ. But the pastor, in order to keep this larger group of unconverted people, he caters to them. So while he is feeding these carnal men and women with carnal things, he is letting the sheep of God starve to death. And he is going to stand before God one day in judgment. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Have you ever heard the term ecstasis worship? No? <laughs> oh, many people haven't. It's a powerful word. It's a Greek word that means, well, you'll find out in a, in a little while because I want to introduce to you Caleb Brundage. He's one of our itinerant ministries, but also just a worshiper with so much passion. In fact, if you've been to any of our conferences, you'll see Caleb flagging and worshiping God and opening up the heavens and operating in a real breaker level anointing. He actually is a DJ as well and leads a lot of Christian events and weddings and, and uh, you know just high school events and things like that. So if you would ever like to know more about him, he's on our itinerant page on our website. But today he's going to tell you about Club Mysterio and about the ecstasis worship that takes place during those times of, of uh, gathering together. So it's my privilege to introduce to you Caleb Brundage. This generation is hungry, hungry for the mysteries of God. This generation longs to experience God in a way, in an abandoned way. Like never before. They long to release their passion for God. When we're making decrees and we're praising God, the music and you're jumping and you're, you're, you're dancing and you're moving around, well, the words that we're speaking becomes one at a cellular level in your body and it's not like you're learning it, it's part of who you are. It's no longer that you have to study the word, it's no longer that you have to study the word, it's no longer that you have to study the word.
when you're inside of an infused atmosphere with dancing and your body is moving and the word is coming and the music, it becomes part of you. And it's just like, oh man, with the, with the rhythm, the sound, and the repetitiveness of the music, the word is driven into your body, not just your mind, not just your soul, but the whole mind, body, and soul. Extasious worship is worship that when you go outside of your mind, when you go outside of your mind, when you go outside of your mind, yourself and to abandon worship with God, going into the ecstasy of God. Club Mysterio is a place where you can come and experience ecstasious worship. What is happening around the world in many places now is so very much the spirit of a serpent, so very clearly the work of the enemy. I believe that Kenneth Hagin has been operating in the spirit of a sorcerer since 1938. That's 59 years. I believe he's been building and bewitching the people all during these 59 years. This was the Kenneth Hagin Holy Ghost meeting. In that meeting, it is very clear to me that the spirit of the serpent was manifest. The primary things that I saw was the hissing, like the hissing of a serpent. And of course, to go with that was the tongue of this man, Kenneth Hagin, coming out and slithering like the tongue of a serpent. is laughing at these foolish people. And such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 
Here is a metaphysical, paranormal power by which they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is of no great thing if his ministers also be transformed, metaphysical, paranormal, as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. That every human being was a god. God came from heaven, became a man, made man into little gods. You say, Benny Hinn, am I a little god? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? What, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say I am, you're saying I'm a part of him, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? You can't be human. Because you are divine. But I'm to be poor. So, I mean, what's God supposed to call us? Doesn't the Bible say we're created in his image? I'm a God man. I'm a sample of Jesus. I'm a God man. We are Christ. 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 And it's one thing to have, you know, God gather the people together. Yeah. It's another thing to have the same spirit, the Benjamin generation, yeah. having the same mother. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Mother Grace. Amen. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Mother Grace. Amen. And the same Mother Grace. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Mother Grace. Amen. is a longtime friend and partner of this ministry, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. I know my grandparents were in your country yes, 2005, 2005, I think, and uh, you were a strong support to them in that meeting, and I know they've never forgotten. I enjoyed having them. And uh, of course, they love you, and they love your ministry. And uh, somebody I want to introduce to you, Brother Tony, come on up, would you please? He's going to be telling you the story. I asked him to come give his testimony, and he's got a special message for us tonight. Hostel Church. Like I said, I came to radical faith, both me and Emiliana, my wife. We had radical conversion experiences. We've been raised in the word of faith. But uh, I've been in the word of faith, so to speak. We call it the word of faith, you know, um, for for many years now. We've been raised in the word of faith. We call it the word of faith, you know, um, for for many years now. We've been raised in the word of faith. Pope was Mario Jorge Bergoglio, 
my friend, my spiritual father had become the Pope. So tonight, the Pope, it's a historic moment because I've never, I've served three Popes. Because I've never, I've served three Popes. Because I've never, I've served three popes. Because I started working with them when John Paul was still alive, and then Pope Benedict, and now Pope Francis. And you know, Pope Francis, Saint Francis of Assisi was an open charismatic. This is the first pope in history that took the Francis's name, because he's openly charismatic. Because he's openly charismatic. How misunderstood he is especially among us in the charismatic uh, uh, circle. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. Dear brothers and sisters, And it's one thing to have, you know, God gather the people together. Yeah. It's another thing to have the same spirit, the Benjamin generation. Yeah. Having the same mother. Yeah. Having the same mother. Yeah. Having the same mother. Yeah. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Mother Grace. And the same Mother Grace. And the same Mother Grace. It's gaining momentum. There's a whole generation that has experienced the gospel revolution. They're a grace generation and a whole, a whole new sound, the sound of grace, the sound of grace. It's a grace generation. It's a generation that has a mother who is called grace. It's a generation, the generation that, has that has a mother who is called grace. grace. The ancient religion of Babylon, they all have one thing in common, the sacred feminine, the sacred feminine, the sacred feminine. Ishtar of the Babylonians, Tyre of the Buddhism, Fatima of Muhammad, Sophia of the Gnostics, Shekinah to the Kabbalist Jew, Mary to the Catholic, and Shakti to the Hindu. These all have one thing in common, the sacred feminine. And the sacred feminine is going to take you back to the source of light. Because the light that resides in that place that Plato talked about you need a path to get back to that light. Listen, this is important. She is the one to take you to that light. Now, I'm going I'm to give you a guess. Tell me this morning, who do you think that light is? Do you remember what this subject's all about? Lucifer. He's the light bearer.
take you to that light. Secratus, ad noctis huius caliginem destruendam, in deficiens perseveret. Et in odorem suavitatis acceptus, supernis luminaribus misceatur, flama seius, Lucifer matutinus inveniat. Ille in quam Lucifer, qui nescit o casum, Christus filius tuus, qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis herrenus iluxit. Et te convivit et reniat, in secula seculorum. Vi benedico, che fratello a fratello. Jesus said these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and him whom you sent, Jesus Christ. I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them through your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. My friends, my spiritual father, my spiritual father had become the Pope. Un abbraccio. Grazie. Oh. I want you to video a message back. Come up here and let's do it this way so he can see this, this whole congregation. My dear sir, thank you so from the bottom of our hearts. 
All of these leaders represent literally tens of thousands of people that love you, that believe God with you, and in answer to your request, we have just prayed for all you around and me are familiar and we do faces, so with all of our hearts. Out we bless faces, you with all of our souls. Out we bless faces, you with all of our minds. And we thank you for the daily races. We thank you. Going nowhere. And so going nowhere. All of us. And we pray I mean, I thank God for, for you know, teachers like Brother Copeland, you know, Brother Hagen, and Brother E. W. Canyon. You know, they they taught. And I find it kind of funny. I find it kind of sad. The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had. I find it hard to tell you. I find it hard to take. When people run in circles, it's a very, very that Hill Song is unparalleled. Have you ever been told that you're, you're part of a cult? <laughs> yep. The music's amazing. It's freaking phenomenal. It's not cool to be a Christian or to be religious at all. The number of Australians who call themselves Christian is falling and fast. There are almost a million fewer Christians than there were just five years ago. But there is one Christian denomination that's bucking that trend. Each week, nearly 40,000 Australians flock to 27 locations around Australia for what is surely the most iconic evangelical church in Australia, Hillsong. Who's ready to praise God today? Come on, let's put our hands together. Pentecostal churches like Hillsong are on the rise. Membership has grown by 18% in the past decade. And almost half of those are under the age of 30. Now, I should admit at this point that I have some history with Hillsong. I was raised in a series of evangelical churches, including Hillsong, and much to my mother's chagrin, I have had nothing to do with the church in years because sitting is great. But we are here to talk to young Hillsongers to find out what it is about the church that is attractive to them, and also to ask some of the big questions facing Australia right now, like how did they vote in the same-sex marriage survey? Melissa was brought up in a Christian household, but only went to church occasionally. I've been to Catholic churches all my life and it was the most boring thing and it was not inviting. But Hillsong was a different story. So what were your first impressions? You walk in here and what goes through your head? 
I walked in, there were so many people. Everyone was like smiling, laughing. There's like music playing. I thought it was like a party. Mm. I wasn't going really to, you know, get a connection with God or anything. I just wanted to go because it was fun. You left school at the age of 15 and I understand you went through a fairly dark period. I, I definitely did. I actually stopped going to church. Um, I was really mentally unstable, hurting myself like quite badly, cutting myself. I literally hated myself. Eventually, Melissa's family encouraged her to go back to church. My life didn't turn around in a moment, but that was kind of my like epiphany of like, okay, you've got to do this, you've got to change. And it just gave me some hope. What gave you hope? I would walk into the church and I would just feel this sensation of happiness, really, and just belonging. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like someone was looking down on me or touching me or giving me a hug, really. I just knew within myself that it was definitely God. It's here in Sydney's Hills District that Hillsong has its roots. Established by young Pentecostal pastors Brian and Bobby Houston in the mid-1980s, Hillsong now has churches in 19 countries and boasts weekly attendance globally of 100,000 people. And of course, there's the celebrity members. I just enjoy seeing people worship, praising God. I grew up like, I had no friends, I had no one growing up. I actually wanted to kill myself like before I came to Australia actually. Eric's family moved to Australia from the Philippines when he was a teenager and like Melissa, the church he'd grown up in didn't really resonate with him. That was until a friend invited him to Hillsong. I was just gobsmacked. The preacher just asked if you want God in your life, I just want you to run to the front. I just ran like, I felt like this was my turning point in my life. God was like, you know what, I'm here, I'm actually real. What does God feel like? The warm comfort, like basically, lo basically love. Two months after Eric joined Hillsong, his world was completely shaken up. My mom actually got cancer, like stage three, like fi like fifteen percent of the chance of living. It was like I lost, basically lost hope. Did you feel betrayed? I feel, sh I feel like backstabbed. I felt like I thought you were with me, God. What, like what the heck? One night, I just had a nightmare of like, mom just died. I was just like crying on my bed. And I felt like someone just hugging me so warmly, just like so tight, like, I'm here, don't worry, don't be afraid. Then uh, one month later, then mom was better. Like, you wouldn't realize she had cancer like a year ago. So we've just met Eric. I think it's a very common story. When a parent is sick or you're facing a life and death struggle in your life, those are the moments in your life when um, Pentecostal Christianity is really effective because it's, high emotion, uh, a, a deeply ingrained community. You know, it's funny, like, because for me, I was a very angsty, lonely kid. And the reason Hillsong appealed to me, it was big and it was enveloping and people really did care and invest and, and people really did provide the family and provide um, the warmth that you know, I wasn't getting in school and I definitely wasn't getting at home. The church is failing to adapt to contemporary culture and Hillsong has done the complete opposite. Tim was a regular Hillsonger for a while, but dropped back because of what he describes as theological differences. I'll go occasionally with friends and family, but I think Hillsong's like Maccas. It's good every now and then, but you couldn't live off it. What do you reckon is the most misunderstood thing about Hillsong? Money. Why money? The perceived, I think, attitude is that Hillsong's all about money, it's a business, it's all about making and maximising profits. But I think the intention is a lot more pure. Hillsong's revenue in 2016 was $161 million. That is 16% up from the previous year. Over half of that came from donations. And like all churches in Australia, Hillsong's earnings are tax free. If you use your phone to the App Store, Google Play, you can download the Hillsong Giving app. And I think that's what makes people uncomfortable. It's like, well, why are you telling me, I'm a single mother of three with living on, you know, $24,000 a year, telling me to give 10% of my income? It's almost manipulative to tell people, give money to me or give money to the church and you'll be blessed for it. Is that enhanced by the sheer production value of the event? Yes, definitely, 100%, because um, the church obviously doesn't need it. 
If we're going to grow, we need to spread. If we're going to spread, we have to grow. You can see it in natural ways. If someone is involved in financial investment, maybe building a property portfolio, what has to happen? They have to grow their capital. They have to grow their finances. And if they can grow their finances, they can spread their portfolio. But then they also spend so much of their money on community outreach programs. Like where every Christmas they just fill a bus with Christmas presents and they go around to disadvantaged families and they give these families Christmas presents. Hillsong turned down multiple opportunities from the feed to be interviewed, but we do know how much they spend on those charitable missions. Of Hillsong's $161 million revenue last year, 15% was spent on charitable missions, just above spending on corporate services, and almost 40% of revenue went to church services, including paying pastors. The perception is that you give 10% of your wage. Yeah. I think I think that's what I've heard. Yeah. I've probably given about $4 to Hillsong. If you want to give, you can give. If you don't, like it's all cool. The other thing that has come up, there is a perception out there that that Hillsong is something of a cult. Oh, it makes me really angry. Why and does I, it make you angry? Oh, because it's just ridiculous. If I was to meet someone and be like, oh, I go to Hillsong, yeah, get that look. Like, really? <laughs> Do you really, you go to Hillsong? Like, are you weird? <laughs> the end of my Christianity does not go out with a bang. It goes out with a whimper. It goes out with slowly going less and less and less. And when secular friends make jokes about Hillsong being a cult, you just quietly shrink into the background and hope nobody asks you what you think. What do you want to do? I want to be a pastor now. Like, that's basically what I want to do. Eric already gives much of his time to Hillsong as a youth leader working with Year 8 boys. Right now, uh, Australia has a very big uh, survey on about same-sex marriage. If one of your boys came up to you and said, I think I'm gay, what would your response to him be? I would just say, dude, no matter what happens, I'll still love you no matter what. If I start treating him differently because he was gay, then I, I basically felt like I failed. Should he then also have the right to get married? Um, it was a good discussion. Like, I don't want to go through this. I believe homosexuality be wrong, personally. And I think that what's right is right, regardless of whether or not a culture believes it to be right. Um, so I think everyone can agree that killing a baby is wrong regardless of the culture that you're in. What you just argued then was that there is a moral equivalence between two gay people wanting to get married and killing a baby. Oh, well, I never compared killing a baby I with... I didn't say you compared them, there's a moral equivalence. Yes, but there is a... I, yeah, I agree. Um, look, they're different types of wrong and they're very, diff very different consequences. What uh, are the consequences in being gay? Well, you don't have to look... You can look throughout history and see that... Uh, uh, STDs, AIDS come about largely due to the um, largely due to a lot of homosexual behaviour. Right now, Australia is having a very big conversation about same-sex marriage, and Brian Houston put out a statementy thing, basically came down on he's voting no. Yeah. Where do you stand on that topic? Um, I'm totally all for it. S same-sex marriage. Yeah, definitely all for same-sex marriage. Has a bit more meaning for you than it does. For a lot of people, doesn't it? Why yeah, is that? It definitely does. Well, I am bisexual. I've had a couple of girlfriends and I've had boyfriends. Um, I feel like I was born like this. So I can't imagine that God would have made me um, with my sexuality if it wasn't natural or it wasn't normal. Does it feel good to say it out loud? It feels really good to say it out loud. Imagine I'm Brian Houston. How would you go about convincing him that you deserve marriage? as much as I do, as much as he does. I would just let him know, like, this is how I feel, it's not affecting him. If I was to get married to a female, how is that possibly affecting his life? And those handful of passages in the Bible that say things like, you know, a man shall not lie with a man and stuff like that, like, but when you see those things there, how do you think about those? I kind of just look over them. <laughs> I would just read it and be like, all right, cool. I'll just flip the page like the world's evolved. Hillsong is sold as young, hip and modern, but at the end of the day, it's still a community that is ostensibly based on the knowledge of a 2,000 year old book. They've picked and chosen which elements of this modern age that they are willing to adopt, the bright lights, the four chords, and which parts they're still choosing to ignore.
same-sex marriage. As heaven and earth sing, holy is the name, holy! There's a tension at the heart of Hillsong between the ancient and the modern, and as Australian society, at least, changes and evolves, there's a very big question as to whether Hillsong can change with it. Just saw this new disturbing video from Hillsong entitled Peace. It's on their Hillsong Young and Free channel. Notice that uh, it has 7,000 dislikes, and there's a reason for that. We're going to go over it real quick here. Also, notice there's no comments allowed. Probably the main reason is because this video is so disturbing, and it seems to be basically saying the opposite of what the lyrics say. Now, it starts off with five women in white. I would say it is for purity or maybe they're virgins. It kind of reminds me of Revelation with the crowns. Looks like they're brides of Christ maybe, like these are churches symbolically. At least this is what you would think with Revelation. This is kind of what it reminds me of, but it starts to focus in on this woman in the back. And what happens is there's a woman singing while these five are sitting here, and the woman singing is in red. Now, of course, if you think of Revelation, who's red? You have the red dragon. And, of course, the lady in red in a cult terminology is referring to the devil as well. Now, she's singing sort of like a siren, like she's trying to, to impress these women that are in white. Now, you see this light shine on her eyes, and this light somehow gets her to want to take her crown off. And the way she takes her crown off is just otherworldly. It's not, it doesn't look like a human is doing it. And you can see she has long nails. It kind of reminds me of like sort of like a witch or something. Reminds me of like maybe a music video from Beyonce or Madonna or something like that. You know, some occultic video. So she takes off her crown and casts it down. But of course, Christ is not here so she's not casting it down to Christ. All we have here is this red lady who is like a siren. She then takes off her veil and starts walking towards the red woman or the lady in red. And she also has these very short shorts, which is kind of strange as well. And then what happens is you start to see influence on these other four women as well, these four brides, I would say, coming from this woman in red, and you start to see light, and also you'll start seeing like film or maybe videos playing in the background here and also on the women. You can start to see video, almost like social media influence on these women, and of course if we take the symbology from the, New, from the New Testament, from Revelation, these would be churches. This would be a, a church or a bride of Christ in white with a crown. That's how we're supposed to be presented before Christ. And it's like this, this woman in red is influencing them with social media, with videos, with maybe cell phones or whatever, you know. Who knows, just multimedia, social media. And then what happens is it has some real influence on these women and it gets them to like take off their crowns as well and cast them down. So then the other women cast their crowns as well. Almost like they're forsaking their crowns, right? And we see also more videos playing in the background like influence from videos and movies and, and music. And then we see her walking up to the light, this false light, Luciferian light. And when it hits her eyes is when these things happen. You know, back in the back, when she was in the back, the, the light made her take the crown off. Okay. And then now, her eyes are fully in the light. This false light, you can see it's a rainbow light, which is also a symbol for the devil. Okay, and then all of a sudden she turns red. So she takes on this devilish form as well. 
So it's like the church has forsaken her purity, her crown, and is being influenced by the devil in this false light. This is kind of how I see it. Now that's what I think is being said by the video. I don't think this is I don't think this is just like, you know, some director for Hillsong that just is trying to be worldly and trying to influence people and trying to how can I make it a bigger hit? You know, I don't think it's like that. I think this is deliberate and very direct. You can't accidentally do that. I don't think I mean using biblical symbolism from revelation or just occultic symbolism it's pretty obvious what they're saying okay and of course this ain't the first time hillsong church has done something that would <laughs> that would be bad okay we have carl lentz of course who's the new york city pastor of hillsong and he i've done a number of videos covering him here's one right here where he went on oprah and he did something, I, mean, I think what he did is he basically denied the gospel or something really huge that had to do with the gospel, if I recall correctly, when he was being interviewed by Oprah. Oprah is a New Age false Christian. Of course, Carl Lentz also is the mentor of Justin Bieber. And you can see right here, Bigger Than Satan was one of his shirts with Marilyn Manson on the front. You see that? Marilyn Manson right there. So Justin Bieber has his own alleged Christian clothing line with Kanye West. And one of the shirts they sell has Marilyn Manson's face on the front and it says bigger than Satan on the back. Does that sound like a Christian shirt to you? I don't think so. So you have Justin Bieber also going to Hillsong conferences wearing... Actually, let me show you that. I think I have it back here. One sec here. Where did it go? Yeah, here we go. Here we go. We have Justin Bieber going to a Hillsong conference wearing a Marilyn Manson shirt. This is the shirt he's wearing. And him and actually Marilyn Manson became kind of buddies for a while even. He even has a selfie with Marilyn Manson right here. And this is a guy who's supposed to be a, allegedly a Christian. He started out as a Christian. It's sort of like this video here. He started out with maybe a, maybe a real Christian, and then he became what you see right here, a false church, a false Christian that's leading people astray and corrupting others. So also, this I mean, this, it doesn't end there, trust me. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. We'll cover this in a second here. This was an Easter special that was really messed up more like a Guar concert or maybe uh, just Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome or something. And then we have this here. Let me play this for you and you'll see what I'm getting at. This is pretty ridiculous. A woman's conference. You'll be shocked what was at a woman's conference. All right. Spandex underwear. At a woman's Hillsong conference. Okay, so we're talking about alleged... Christian women's conference where you would think you would be taught like Christian godly values or something about the Bible or something, you know, you think you'd be learning something from God, from the Bible, and instead you have a nearly naked cowboy and a bunch of women dressed in short skirts dancing around and then SpongeBob dancing around on the stage and a bunch of other weird stuff it reminded me of like an Adam Sandler movie or something. Uh, that's just one. Okay, then you got this one. Actually, I got to get past the advertisement. Maybe if I hit refresh, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Family uh, and then there's he also does the hand up and down uh, in the center. Uh, right here, it looks like a Baphomet in the center. Uh, and then there's, he also does the hand up and down, uh, Carl Lentz, the guy's name is. Um, and then you got Austin Powers at the women's conference. So you got Naked Cowboy, SpongeBob, Austin Powers, women in, uh, short skirts dancing around with their legs being kicked up in the air towards the crowd, by the way. <laughs> I thought that was really tasteful. Especially in church, you know. Um, and then, of course, I did this video, Hillsong Easter, 
which basically looked like a Guar concert, according to one of my uh, subscribers. I, I thought it looked like Mad Max beat meets uh, Black Magic Illuminati ritual. That happened this year. This is just insane. Just check this out. <laughs> you get the picture there it's pretty disturbing I don't think that looks anything like the passion of the Christ from what I understand yeah. all right so you've seen those two you get kind of an idea of what's going on here so it's almost as if they're telling us what they're doing hidden in plain sight they're trying to corrupt the church they're trying to get you to cast your crown down your purity and to basically listen to the devil in his false light you have these false converts like Carl Lentz, Justin Bieber, uh, Kanye West. All these guys are satanic, but they pretend to be Christian. This is what we got going on, you know. So it's pretty, pretty ridiculous, actually. Kind of wondering what you guys think. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section below. Honestly, I think this is pretty disturbing. And this video, I mean, the fact that they, they have so many thumbs down and they disable the comments, clearly they know what they're, I mean, they know that people don't like this. And, I mean, even if I was completely ignorant, let's just say I didn't know anything about biblical symbology or the occult symbology or anything. Let's just say I'm completely ignorant of all that stuff and I just watched that video. I would think it looked weird anyways. I would think it looked very strange and odd and just off, you know. So... Um, I mean, that alone should just tell you there's something wrong here. And I don't, I don't think it was accidental. I think it was very deliberate. Um, there's some people, some wolves working in on this. I'm not saying everybody at Hillsong's bad, because I actually don't think that's the case. I think there's probably some good people there. I wouldn't doubt it. I think some wolves have crept in, and this is intentional, and they're trying to steer, you know, this whole ministry a wrong direction. And I think, I think Carl Lentz is one of them. I really do. I think he's a big part of it. You know, he's the pastor himself. So, you know, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below, and thanks for watching. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him 
whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Now Trump just gave the order to the Air Force, yes, they are on standby to turn North Korea to ashes. And for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. Ordinary men and women are too small-minded to govern their own affairs. That order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. That order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. Surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. A new world order for the 21st century. If any man had an ear, let him hear. We are, all of you know it, on the edge of a climatic abyss. Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? Brothers and sisters in the Lord. Morning bells are ringing. Morning bells are ringing. You came to the wrong city. It's the end of the world, my friends. Save as many as you can. Surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. The greatest trick the Save devil's ever pulled you can. was convincing the world he didn't exist. Is there anybody out there? It's happened. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same, shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye, that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. 
Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. There was a great earthquake. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. happened. 
The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken. And call the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. It happened. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself, said I. for what's coming. 